So now I want to jump towards the end of HADS's paper. There he covers one topic, um, which is also very important for his claim, and that is that the drum of the Dome of the Rock, um, so that's basically the, the um, circular um, section here of, of the dome, um, that this drum was originally also an octagon, um, like the ambulatory below. And um, we've seen his claims before. He's arguing that this was uh, reconstructed in the 18th century and was then on, only then became circular. And it, the main line of reasoning that he has is by looking at imagery. And that's something we want to look at now before we continue with the rest of the work. Um, because once again, we can sort of deduce how AJD is works by, by going through that. No, yeah. Now here we have him, um, we have him show us a uh, little cutout from a larger painting, which was a uh, done in the 15th century. Um, A.J. writes, The Three Marys at the Tome is a panel painting from around, 410 to four, uh, from around 1410 to 1426 AD or perhaps 1440. Um, it, it is attributed to Hubert van Eyck or his workshop. Now here he already makes a mistake. This is not attributed to Hubert van Eyck but to Jan van Eyck. Okay, um, not a big deal, can happen. That's fine. Um, let me show you the the full picture actually. And yeah, and typically it is said to have been um, completed around 1440. So late uh, the the later option that he gives. So what we can see here, yeah, with the three Marys at the tomb, and in the background there's Jerusalem and there's this building which yeah kind of looks like the Dome of the Rock and indeed let's, let's zoom in a bit and indeed it has an octagonal drum um, yeah so it's not circular so that's um, evident piece of evidence number one regarding this okay now then the next one is um, yeah, this little woodcut um, we see on the top right. And this was done by um, Erwin, er, Erhard Reuwig, uh, so, so this guy. Um, he was an artist who was taken to a uh, journey to the Holy Land by this guy here, by Bernhard von Breitenbach. Um, so Bernhard von Breitbach, he was um, quite rich actually, and he was also um, in the clergy, and he had the intention of um, yeah, making a travel log, a, a book of, about his travels to the Holy Land, and from the outset he knew that he wanted to have um, pictures in there, because that's, so book printing had just started, we are now here in towards the end of the 15th century, and yeah, well, books were really hot, um, but he wants to up his game a bit by adding these these pictures of faraway places um, which uh, people had never seen before. So that's why he took this guy with him. Uh, yeah, at least so um, we are told. But yeah, there's good reason to believe that it is true. Um, now, what does HAD is right about this? In the detail of his account, the onion-shaped dome with its axis hatch, which is missing in Van Eyck's painting, as well as the octagonal drum stand out. Each side of the drum is supported by a strong pillar, five of which are, see are visible, and has two windows. The main building can otherwise be recognized as it stands today, although it has six openings per side. Um, and here, luckily, um, I happen to have a copy of this book. Um, let me get this real quick. Um, here it is. So this is a 
a reprint of um, the actual book from the 15th century. So it's pretty much exactly how it would have been if you bought it in the 15th century, um, with the exception of the cover. I guess this looks more like a 19th century style book cover, if you ask me. But then I'm not an expert. Um, you tell me in the comments. <laughs> uh, yeah, is this 19th century or did they have this sort of style in the 15th century already? I don't know. But on the inside, um, it's exactly how it used to be. So you have nice woodcuts. So here, this is the, um, the coat of arms of, of von Breitenbach, who made the book. And then yeah, you have uh, yeah, like this typical uh, focus, this typical Gothic font um, of the 15th century. Um, very beautiful. Um, and it does contain lots and lots of woodcuts. That's why um, he took Erhard Reubig with him, right? And they were done in a way, so they were done as foldouts even, so which was um, yeah, uh, innovation at the time, I guess. So I can show you here. This is now the Jerusalem foldout from which AJ has taken the... Uh, all right, difficult to show. <laughs> um, yeah, and you can see in the center there is the Dome of the Rock. Unfortunately, it's right um, where the pages are glued together. Um, so difficult to, to make out in my version. Luckily, I do have a digital version as well, which I can show you. Yeah, so this this is a colored. Um, version of that same of that same foldout um, in an old manuscript though not in a reprint like mine um, yeah if you if you could afford it you could hire somebody to um, color your books um, that was that was a big thing back then um, but before we look at this in a bit more detail let me read to you what Breitenbach actually wrote when he descri described the Dome of the Rock um, All right, he writes. Von Solomons Tempel, item von Dannen, kamen wir an ein Ende, da man Usen Salomons Tempel seht, mit rondem Werk und griechischer Arbeit erbaut, mit behauen und polierten oder geebneten Steinen. Um, so, let me translate it. <laughs> so, he writes about the Temple of Solomon. Um, we came um, to a, an end um, from where we could see Solomon's temple, which was built in the Greek style and with a round uh, dome, a round drum. So in this very book, which um, is supposed to, supposedly evidence for the drum of the Dome of the Rock being octagonal, um, it is described as being round. So now let's let's look at the picture a bit closer. And yeah, it can be interpreted as being octagonal, but really if you look at it closely, there is here one straight line going along horizontally and then here it makes a little it bends upwards and everything else these are the um, that make it look like it's octagonal is due to these um, um, these support pillars um, they go, um, yeah have this sort of um, perspective view on them this three-dimensional view which gives it the appearance of there being um, being corners but there really isn't it's just a straight line um, what is this picture? It's a woodcut, which means that everything that isn't black is carved out of a piece of wood. So basically you create a negative of the image. And there's of course no room for error, because you can't undo anything. Once you've, you've taken the wood away, it's done, it's gone. Um, it, won't, won't, you won't come, it won't come back, you ca one can't erase it. So making woodcuts is a very delicate um, job and here again we're looking at a very delicate um, drawing or, or um, yeah, depiction you see lots of these black lines going down here to um, give us the impression of the perspective um, in here and those are the areas that are the hardest to do um, 
and then we have the added problem or the added difficulty of first of all doing the perspective of an octagon then having the roof of the octagon go slightly up and then going into a round um, drum um, not easy to do um, i guess and we can see that here so that's why we have here this straight line and then this bend here so i think he didn't intend to make it appear like an octagon it turned out that way because of these support pillars um, but if you remove them in your mind um, it doesn't look octagonal at all and also if you look at it these support pillars they don't align with the edges of the octagon down here um, which wouldn't make sense if it was supposed to be octagonal and indeed we will see later on that in all the other versions where it is octagonal they do align um, yeah so it's probably a, it's not a clear-cut case so i can't say for certain that he intended it to be round I th but i think he did not um, i mean and of course because the book itself tells that it was round um, since the, these two people were there together um, so Reuwig and von Breitenbach, they were there together. Um, I assume they've seen the same dome, and if the one in the book describes it as being round, then the artist presumably also wanted to depict it as being round. It just it turns out to be quite difficult to do it as a woodcut. That would be my interpretation of the evidence. Okay, what is AJ's interpretation? He writes, these two eyewitnesses, Van Eyck and Reuwig, are independent of each other. Um, the second part is likely true. Um, they were very likely independent of each other. The first part isn't, because we don't know that Van Eyck was an eyewitness. In fact, we don't know that Reuwig was an eyewitness. Um, in the case of Reuwig, who made the woodcut, um, it's very likely that he was an eyewitness, because the story is that he uh, accompanied van Breitbach to the Holy Land. It makes sense because a lot of the woodcuts that are in the book, in, in this book here, um, a lot of the woodcuts in here are indeed new and uh, hadn't been printed before. But not all of them. And that's why there are some doubts. Some people question whether van Roy actually was on that trip. Because roughly half of the woodcuts in this book, um, particularly the Italian cities uh, here, are based on pre-existing woodcuts that circulated mainly in Italy, um, but also north of the Alps. Um, so basically just took those woodcuts and copied them and made his own version of, of, of them. And that's why people, some people th say, um, well, he wasn't actually on this trip um, with Van um, Breitenbach. Um, he just copied existing woodcuts. But I would, I would side with those who say he was an eyewitness. He'd be likely just on their way, if they found um, nice prints of, of the cityscapes, they just bought them instead of making their own um, drawings and then um, they used those as, as um, blueprints. That's my opinion anyway. But in case of Van Eyck, um, it is different. Now, if it was Hubert Van Eyck, um, which he claimed initially, there would have been no chance in hell that he would have ever seen the Holy Land. He was a relatively poor artist in the Netherlands. Um, now with Jan van Eyck, there is a possibility. It's possible that he was in the Holy Land. The thing with Jan van Eyck is he was, the, he was in the service of the Duke of Burgundy. Uh, the Duke of Burgundy in the 15th century is probably the richest monarch in all of Europe, um, richer and more powerful than both the French king and the Holy Roman Emperor. And because Jan van Eyck was in the service of uh, the Duke of Burgundy, um, his name was Philip the Good, all of his life is accounted for. So we know exactly when Jan van Eyck went, got where, what he did there, whom he met, um, to which occasions he was taken and so on. So all of his life is accounted for, except for a short little bit where he went on a special mission. Um, that's all we know. Um, so the, the Duke sent him on a special mission. And we don't know it where and um, don't even know I think how long it took. But yeah, so this, this period um, he's not accounted for. And some people say, well, because he drew that picture of the Dome of the Rock, 
it's likely that he went to the Holy Land and that was the special mission and he had to do something there. But really, that would be quite the coincidence that he went there exactly in that short period of time where we don't know where he was. So I would put a big question mark there. I mean, it's possible that Jan Feig was an eyewitness. Um, is it likely? I don't. I wouldn't think so. Um, so I think we have to be very careful with with him. And and of course, he disagrees with the description of the eyewitness, of the proven eyewitness, of the person we know was in the Holy Land. Let's look at some more pictures. Okay, yeah, here we are. So, in, a, in 1493, the Nuremberg Chronicle is published. It contains a trove of invaluable woodcuts, the Temple Mount among them, not the least because most of them must have been created before the Alhambra degree and the expulsion of all Jews and Muslims from Spain. So, I'm not sure how the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain, or the lack thereof, has anything to do with this. Um, maybe because people in Spain would have had a better chance of having seen it before. I don't, I don't know. Um, um, yeah, that's pretty weird. But um, it's true that the 19, uh, that the 1493 Nuremberg Chronicle does have some very, very cool woodcuts. Among them is uh, several versions of the Temple of Solomon. Uh, so one here on the top right, um, which it kind of kind of looks a bit like the Dome of the Rock, but then not really. Um, then this one is another one, <coughs> already somewhat different. But then we have also this one, which looks already much closer to what we are familiar with. And indeed, the reason is pretty simple, um, because it's a copy of Oivis, uh drawing, which is here on the bottom is still. Um, Actually, as it happens, I also have that book. Um, one second. So, here we have the so-called Nuremberg Chronicle. Um, it was made by uh, yeah, this guy, Hartmann Schädel, who was an um, intellectual in Nuremberg. That's, that's why it has the name. And as it happens, uh, the travel log by um, Bernhard von Breitenbach was also published in Nuremberg. So these the people here who made this chronicle were fully aware of these woodcuts in the book. And they, so Hartmann Schild had a similar idea as Breitenbach. Breitenbach wanted to have a sort of a bestseller by um, doing the popular travel um, book at, of the time, but um, enhancing it with these woodcuts. And, and they did something very similar for this book. This is a, cro a chronicle of the world. Um, those had existed before and after, but the novel thing here was that it's full of woodcuts. Um, and yeah, again, we are here at the very early days of book printing, so keep that in mind. And I'll just show you something, a random page here. So this is a copy of, um, yeah, of an actual old um, book. Yeah, and there we have tons and tons of woodcuts in here of of people, of cities, of events, and of course a lot of a lot about it is. Um, a lot of the early history of the world back then was um, based on the Bible. Uh, so we have lots of biblical motifs, including the Temple of Solomon. One thing people back then did when they, um, when they depicted biblical stories was that they took the motifs and, and put them in their own time. So when they were talking about the Temple of Solomon, they would indeed try to make it the Dome of the Rock. When, but also in other motifs. So there are pictures of um, Mary and baby Jesus on, on a, at a breakfast table, in a typical medieval breakfast table. So they took those stories and they put it in their own time. They gave, um, in the pictures, they gave people like armor and weaponry of the 15th century, um, yeah, fashion, but also the buildings, everything. So they, they put it in their time and they didn't do it because they were stupid or they didn't know that things um, were different in the past. They did it to sort of have a closer connection to these biblical stories. Um, 
So that was the motif. They, they obviously knew that what they were doing and that uh, Mother Mary never sat at the breakfast table, of, uh, at the medieval breakfast table. Um, but they did it anyway because, yeah, that, that way they, they felt they could get closer to, to that story. So when in this chronicle they depict the Temple of Solomon, um, they did indeed try to use the um, Dome of the Rock as a template. But what has happened when they when they made this book? They first, before they even started writing it, uh, writing it down, they commissioned um, artists to produce those woodcuts. So that I think they had two or three years time to produce hundreds and hundreds of woodcuts. And of course, they wouldn't go to all those places, um, all the cities of the world that are depicted in here and take notes and, and um, come back and make those woodcuts, that, that wouldn't have been possible. They took the information they could get. And one, one, one thing that was easy to get was Breitenbach's book with the Dome of the Rock. And that was then used um, by one of their artisans to create his own version. So he's reassembled things a little bit in, in, um, in his version here. Yeah, so for instance, he's, he's moved the Tower of Solomon here, he's moved the, the staircase slightly to the left, he's moved in uh, this little dome, which may be the Dome of, uh, dome of Jains, I don't know. He, but here, the, these buildings, they are still the same. Um, why did they do it? Because the, the point here was not realism, unlike with, from Bre with Breitenbach's book. The point here is to transport a, a mythological or, or a, a, a symbol. It has to be symbolic. Um, it's symbolic of of the times um, of Solomon. That's the approach here. So it's not meant to be realistic, um, which is something to keep in mind. That's a problem um, that will come up again and again in AJ Dias's um, argument. He takes um, art. Um, these these paintings which are not supposed to be realistic and he interprets them as if they were depicting reality as it was back then. Yeah. Another woodcut is dedicated to the destruction by siege of Jerusalem. Um, let's hear this one. Um, let me show you real quick. I think I can, I can show you in the book which uh, how, it, how it looks like here. Should have prepared this. Um, not very professional. So first of all, here we have uh, here we have the dome in my version. So I've got a colored colored version. Um, where the destruction was here. We got it. Yeah, so here we have the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, what does he say about it? However, the text leaves open which destruction it may refer to. Um, actually, it doesn't. It is, it's true that it is a bit convoluted because this destruction is now then also taken as a, a symbolic representation of later destruction, so the text does mention it, but it's clearly, clearly in the context of the Babylonian exile of um, Jerusalem being destroyed by the Babylonians. So this is what's depicted here. But then um, it's also mentioned, all the, all the other destructions are also mentioned in the text as well. Um, the adjoining text spans from the chain of Emperors Vespasian, Vespasianus through Constantine to the subjugation of Jerusalem by Prophet Muhammad and beyond. Yeah, so that's, that's what it just said. So um, it's depicting the destruction by the Babylonians, but then um, go through all the other destructions as well. But it's rather confusing that the artistry appears to transcend time. Um, as I explained to you before, this is not confusing at all. This is what the people back then did. Um, it's just um, the, way, the, the way how they approached history. Um, and yeah, this is not an exception. It's literally every pic every depiction of anything ancient that was done in medieval times um, is the same thing. It transcends time. Um, 
maybe not every, I guess I shouldn't be, I shouldn't talk in absolute terms. Maybe you can find an exception here or there, but, but the vast majority will transcend time. The Dome of the Rock is ablaze and a set of towers are toppled, flanked by uh, mounted angels of death. And I'm not sure what he sees there. So I mean, I've got the book and I don't see angels of death anywhere. So I don't know, maybe, maybe you see something that I don't. If anybody finds angels of death, um, let me know. Um, I can't see any. So um, AJ certainly is a, a wild fantasy. I, I, I will give him that. The composition is littered with what seems to be dead bodies. Um, again, I don't see any dead bodies here. I mean, it looks like there are rocks on the ground, which he might interpret as de dead bodies. So I don't know, maybe, maybe these things here, uh, these little circular things with lines underneath them, he thinks are dead bodies, but clearly they look different than the upright bodies. So I would say they are rocks. Um, yeah, I don't see any dead bodies here. With a mourner, a person in chains, and a homicide in progress. Well, there are two people close together. They may be killing each other, I don't know, but I don't see any weapons, but then it's very small. Um, there's a horse. I don't, know if, I don't know how you would know if somebody's mourning there, but I guess it makes sense if, if the temple is on fire and the city and the towers are toppled, so it makes sense that they would mourn. Um, but yeah, um, definitely, definitely a very vivid fantasy on ancient uses part. Um, on the mountain, Musa, uh, Mua Satana stands the uh, dismounted Satan himself, Prophet Muhammad. The author hates him to the extent that he fails to provide useful information about the Saracen history, let alone about the inside of the Dome of the Rock. Um, again, um, uh, how, how does AJ deduce that this is Muhammad? Um, we are looking at a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. In the background, yes, we look, it looks like um, a devil figure. Um, but why should it be Muhammad? Why is it not a representation of evil or just Satan himself? Um, then the author hates Muhammad to the extent that he fails to provide, provide any useful information about the Saracen history. So actually he does provide um, he does write about the history. He does, there's an entire chapter about Muhammad, which is pretty interesting. And he's right, it's not very useful because it doesn't seem to be very accurate. But then again, we're talking about a guy who sat in Nuremberg reading books. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what he read somewhere. He didn't have first hand knowledge. Um, so, and how should he have been able to provide useful information about the inside of the Dome of the Rock? Um, Hartmann Schädel never was there. Of course, none of the artists were ever near uh, there. Who, the artists who, who made these woodcuts, they were just, um, yeah, um, they didn't earn that well usually. So they were just uh, um, for hire and they <laughs> worked for a commission, but they could never go to Jerusalem. Only the very rich or the clergy could do that. Um, so it, it's amazing, like, what does AJ believe? I mean, sh there was no Zoom call to Jerusalem. And of course, there are also other woodcuts with the devil in the background. So typically with a martyrs um, or something, um, they are destruction. I'm, I'm looking right now, again, I sh probably should have prepared this. Um, but it's not the only occurrence of a, of a devil figure. Um, so why, why would this then be Muhammad? Is Muhammad also in the picture when somebody is martyred? Okay, I think I think there are more, but like here is another one. Um, you can hear, I can see it. a martyr story, and in the background there is a devil on this column that breaks down. That is. Uh, Who's being martyred here? 
Judas Tadeus. Okay. So. Uh, Oh yeah, here, uh, there are some more, Simon the Apostle, Matthias the Apostle, so yeah, they all have um, devils in the background here, the one on the top, and also here the one on the bottom, so there are plenty of devils in the background um, whenever something bad is happening here, it doesn't mean that it's Muhammad, um, but there is Muhammad in here. Um, it's, this is in a slide, but it, it's actually pretty cool, so I'll, I'll show everyone as well, if I find it. Yeah, I found it. And here we have a depiction of Muhammad uh, sitting there on the on his chair. Um, yeah, and here the long text is basically about the origin of Islam. Um, but yeah, it's not very useful. Um, so AJ is right on that on that count. But then, why would he expect anything else? Um, yeah, I don't know. Then he mentioned something else about this book: the use of crescent moons or roosters, uh, plain globes or lines on churches of uh, of other drawings from Italy, Spain, and France is also mystifying. There I say, Spanish Melkite Christian churches, the kind of Christianity that was still present and protected under Pope Alexander VI in the 14th century. Uh, Melkite Christianity was the dominant religion in Europe. After Pope Alexander, the heretical religion was wiped from the face of the earth by the Inquisition. So, uh, again, I have no idea what he's talking about. First of all, um, roosters aren't a mystery at all, because Christians have put roosters on churches since forever. In fact, one of the pilgrims, which um, in the next video we'll look at some pilgrim stories, one of the pilgrims explicitly mentions that the Saracens copied the Christians because the Christians have always put roosters on their churches and now they put um, this, these moons on their church, on their uh, mosques, which look very similar. Um, so that's not a surprise at all. But more than that, so why are there um, these crescent moons on churches in Europe? The reason is, um, as I told you before, uh, the woodcuts in this book were commissioned long before the book was even written, and there weren't enough woodcuts um, for every little thing, right? So you had a couple of, of bishop prototypes, and then they would have, they would be used whenever there's a bishop mentioned, sort of. Um, the, and similar with, with the cities, um, we're talking about artists in Nuremberg who didn't see the world. Um, so they tried to get information, of course. They, they did get the Breitenbach book oops, um, and could therefore produce a pretty good picture of Jerusalem. But many, many other uh, cities they didn't know anything about. So they used their imagination and they made woodcuts that are generic. It can be used multiple times. Could be used for cities in Europe or in the Orient. So they made buildings that looked like churches, but they put these crescent moons on top, um, which makes it, yeah, generic. Uh, that's the point. Um, yeah, there are lots of there are lots of very good woodcuts of cities which are very accurate and which give us, which also give historians pretty good insights on how those cities looked like. Um, but also usually in the area of Nuremberg, right, so southern Germany. Um, once once we go outside that area, so to I don't know, Italy, Greece, uh, it, it gets um, more and more fantastical in this book because they just didn't know. Um, there was no way of knowing. And then, yeah, all this, this talk about Melkite Christianity, Christianity. So first of all, Melkites are not a heretical group. Um, they are part of the Catholic Church. They live in the Orient. They never were in Spain or, or Europe. Uh, they never were deemed heretical or wiped out. So I have no idea what is going on about here. Um, yeah, uh, complete uh, lunacy, if you ask me. Um, Okay, now we have some more pictures. So the two well-known paintings of the time were inspired by the Dome of the Rock. Raphael's The Marriage of the Virgin rests on artistic imagination. Top right, yeah. Um, 
probably inspired somehow by the Dome of the Rock, but clearly not the Dome of the Rock. Um, this is the artist's imagination. And then similarly, Perugino's painting of the same name shows an octagonal building, bottom right. It essentially consists of the drum absent of the main structure. Although taller and enriched with auxiliary structures that resemble modern buildings, Perugino's window arrangement hint at dependency on the church of the Santo Sepulcro in Pisa. Um, so here we have the second picture. Again, um, not evidence for anything about the Dome of the Rock. This is the artist's imagination. Um, maybe it was inspired by the Dome of the Rock. Maybe it was inspired by the Sepulcro uh, in by the Santa Sepulcro in Pisa. Um, but we can't use this as evidence for anything. This is just um, a, a painting. Next, we have a pilgrimage certificate from 1544 to or 45. It shows a layout of the Haram al Sharif with the Dome of the Rock covering the foundation stone. A lamp hangs from its center on, the, on top. Valley of Hell and Mount of Olives are drawn. The certificate has eschatological undertones distinct from the earlier versions. It is held in red and blue. Um, the building is a decagon with five entrances. So again, um, obviously, I mean, not an octagon. Um, who knows what the, what the artist's intention here was, but clearly not a realistic depiction. Um, I think we can all agree. I mean, AJ says it is an octagon. I say, well, yeah, it is an octagon, but the dome is round. Um, and now here we have a decagon. Um, okay, uh, what, what does it prove? Nothing. Uh, then, right, yeah, here's the next one. Being a disciple of Elia Levita, Sebastian Münster was a highly educated Jew and later supporter of Lutheranism. He, published, he publishes the first German geographical description of the world in 1526 AD which contains a detailed history of Jerusalem and its temple from its biblical beginnings. In it, he also attributes the Dome of the Rock to Umar, then believed to be the original structure called Temple of Solomon. Uh, we have another depiction of the Dome of the Rock with what could be an octagonal um, drum. Actually, again, it's not very clear. It could just as well be round. Um, it's not detailed enough, if you ask me. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a higher quality picture of this one. Maybe let's zoom in and see if we can make anything out there. Yeah, I mean, could be orth could be intended to be orthogonal. Um, now the angle. Uh, wait, sorry, uh, I need to center this a bit more. So, but you see that the, the angles here are a lot smoother than down here in the in the main octagon. So to me, this looks more like it's intended to be round. Um, but then again, either way, it's clearly um, derivative of the bottom um, picture here by, uh, by Reuwig, who was an eyewitness. Here, um, he's using the same um, yeah, elements. I mean, even here in the background, um, here we have the Holy Sepulchre, again, very clearly taken from this this image. Um, and all the little details in the background. Yeah, so th this is clearly der a derivative work from, from the one in the bottom, not an eyewitness. Um, so either way, whether it's round or oct octagonal, um, it's not an eyewitness, so it's not really um, worth, worth bringing up. Um, yeah, then here we have another depiction which has nothing to do with anything. Um, so again, not evidence for anything. Um, here we have a dome with uh, 16 sides. Um, again, not an octagon. Um, now here he brings up a depiction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And because this is so accurate, he says we can trust. So wait, this is again from the um, Sebastian Münster um, 
Chronicle from the 16th century. Um, and he, the argument by AJ is because the Holy Sepulchre here is so so uh, accurate, we can trust his depiction of the Dome of the Rock as well, and he interprets it as having an octagonal drum. Um, it might have an octagonal drum, I think it's borderline, so because the, 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 the angles don't match um, the octagon at the bottom. But again, it could be due to it being a woodcut. But now let me also show you again the um, Holy Sepulchre in the Breitenbach book. Uh, so here we have the sepulchre. Right. And I would say again, it's very clear that all the details that are in here are taken from here. It goes down uh, the, the, here, the, the tiling of the ground, and here, the, the, this building in the background. Um, here, you see this structure up here. Uh, very clearly, a derivative work again. Um, so it makes sense why not, like, if you copy the Dome of the Rock fr from this book, why not also call, copy the Holy Sepulchre? Um, it was done by an eyewitness, obviously we take this. But what does AJ say? It appears that we can trust that these drawings provide for the f f features that make these buildings distinguishable and are also independent from one another. In other words, the drum of the Dome of the Rock was octagonal and the cupola was different from its modern shape. Um, yeah, again, wildly speculative. What does he think that these poor um, workers in these workshops making the woodcuts for a, a book commissioned by Sebastian Münster in the 16th century, that they went to the Middle East, uh, to a hostile territory, in order to make sketches, which they could then bring home and make woodcuts out of? Um, it's absurd. Of course, they, would, they took what they had available in their location, where they lived, and that was this book uh, pretty clear so it's not independent um, it doesn't prove anything and yeah um, how in the world would these artists have gone there um, it's just not feasible so then here we have another picture um, which Right, let me first show you what he writes. In 1552, another contemporary woodcut of Jerusalem is included in Sebastian Münster's Latin version of his cosmography. So still the same guy with the same book, but now it's a later edition, this time in Latin, for the international market. The changed top of the Holy Sepulchre may be noted, but more importantly, the octagonal drum of the Dome of the Rock appear scaffolded as though under construction. I suggest it is primary evidence for the ongoing external decoration. Well, I suggest it's primary evidence for the um, yeah, for AJ's problem with uh, sources, because once again we are looking at a derivative work. Although this time it's a bit more complex. Um, first, again in the background, the Holy Sepulchre. Um, yeah, sure, let me show you. And again, it's clearly taken from the same book once once more. Um, so if you compare again yeah, this with the sepulchre up here, um, it's pretty obvious that the, uh, here we are looking at another another copy of the whole sepulchre here. But the city of Jerusalem is actually taken from a different source now, no longer from um, the Breitenbach book, which has been the source so far. But um, another one, which I also have here somewhere. Let me see if I find it. Yeah. Now let's zoom in a bit. Oh, that's too much. Okay, now we can also um, contrast and compare, I guess. So we can see, obviously, the general shape here, very similar to the one up here of the Dome of the Rock. Um, the background is different because here he has put in the sepulchre from Breitbach's book. But um, all the other little details here, the, the, the towers, um, 
Okay, this this little building here and here and uh, let's zoom out a bit more then we can see better. Um, yeah, so the the Al Aqsa Mosque here and here. <coughs> the way the wall is drawn here and here. Um, the little little dome here and here. Um, yeah, here we have a tower, here we have the same tower. So clearly this is derived once again from another source. Um, and also, of course, here we have these people on top of the, do uh, of the dome here and here. So now if we go zoom back in a little bit, clearly no scaffolding here anywhere. Um, it's just that the picture on the top is a more crude reproduction of the t picture on the bottom. The picture on the bottom is from 1538. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure if it's a an eyewitness. I would think not. Um, so this itself could have been derivative of, for instance, of this book, again, as most, most of these pictures are. Um, but maybe not, who knows. Um, but yeah, here clearly we have an octagonal drum, for whatever that's worth. Um, um, if we're looking at a separate, um, yeah, um, an independent picture, which I'm, I'm not sure, then this could be the first piece of evidence for an octagonal drum, actually. Um, but then it's in contradiction to the eyewitness accounts. And actually in the next video, we will see more eyewitness accounts, um, all of which describe it as being round. Um, but for, either for now, we just want to look at the pictures here. Okay. Um, then here in 1574, the geographer George Poin of Cologne publishes his uh, Théâtre de Cité du Monde. Uh, the drawing is an overview of Jerusalem, which renders details very small. Regardless, the Dome of the Rock is recognizable with an octagonal main building and drum. The, the roof cupola appears a little different, as though the onion-shaped top was missing and was replaced with a spire. Um, Okay, I have no idea what this picture is, but clearly it's not depicting reality. This is uh, yeah, a church spire on the Dome of the Rock. I, like, this is the only, <laughs> only evidence we have for that, so I doubt that this ever happened. Um, probably, again, done by somebody who has never been there and who has read um, descriptions and looked at maybe similar buildings in his, uh, in his area. And then I think we have one more here um, from 1576, which shows Jerusalem with the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock with recognizable details. Um, while the main structure matches the modern appearance, the dome does not. Uh, at, the, at the time of the drawing, the dome was octagonal with two stories of window openings. Yeah. Um, Again, he's like one picture with two stories of window openings, and then he jumps to the conclusion, that, yeah, that's, that's what the Dome of the Rock look, looked like at that time. When all the other uh, pictures don't have that. Um, it's amazing how many reconstructions this dome must have gone under in, in these few years. Um, we had two stories, one story, we have scaffolding, we have a church spire, we have an onion dome. Um, we have uh, six windows, five windows, three windows, um, yeah amazing so they, they must have been very busy um, updating the dome all the time um, the more likely explanation is that once again we're looking at a derivative work and I mean I don't actually I don't know this picture so I don't have a better version but again if I look at Church of His Holy Sepulchre in the background and the Dome of the Rock I would think it might very well be derivative of our good friend um, Breitenbach here um, who, who delivered the blueprint for many, many people who made other, other woodcuts who didn't go to the Holy Land. Because yeah, most people who made woodcuts couldn't afford to. It was only because he, this guy was rich and he took a artist, an artist with him. And I'm not aware of somebody else doing that. So the, here, here it's clearly part of the program uh, to make this travel account with, with um, 
original pictures from from the places he visited. Um, that was the novel thing here, and it was copied directly from the book. Okay, uh, and I have one more picture. So we will look into this um, in a bit more detail in the next episode. Um, but yeah, here at this point now, um, he write, um, AJ writes, Elsarius El Horn was custodian of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem between 1725 and 1726, and secretary of the convent San Salvatoris between 1737 and 1738. His book with drawings of Holy edifices is published in 1744. Horn's design shows something strikingly new, the drum in its modern form. Um, well, kinda. I mean, it's it's a bit too tall, I guess. Um, but he tried, and I think he did a very good job. Um, and yeah, it's round. But uh, as we will see in a minute, that's not novel at all. Um, it's just novel compared to what AJ has shown us before. And then, interestingly enough that the change must have been recent can be taken from an overview of Jerusalem inside the same book. There the drum was still octagonal. Um, the cupola must have been replaced. Okay, so now let's look at the evidence. So we have one book where we have this picture and this picture. And because those two pictures are in the book, AJ concludes that um, during the time or around the time the book was published, the Dome of the Rock was then completely changed once again. Um, I would suggest that these are two different types of pictures with two different intentions behind them. The top one clearly tries to be accurate, an accurate depiction. Um, doesn't always succeed, uh, the drum is a bit too high, but yeah, all in all, pretty good job. The bottom one here clearly is not intending to be um, perfectly accurate. This looks more like a little um, cutout of a map or something along those lines. Um, so a completely different intention here. Uh, I mean, the, working on a woodcut and making all those little details, it's, this is presumably very, very small here. Um, cutting, like carving here these things out. Um, not very easy, very time consuming. So yeah, you make it simple if it's just a map. Um, doesn't mean that there was a major reconstruction going on in 1744 from the bottom to the top. Uh, that's, that's just crazy. Okay, now before we end this one, I'm gonna go through some more pictures with you. Because um, what does the evidence actually look like? So, and the thing is, of course, um, it's not very much survived, uh, of course. I mean, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years have gone by. But what did survive in quite a lot of large number are these Crusader maps. And what we can see here, I mean, it is, of course, um, abstract, but we can still make something out. So here in, here in the bottom, um, well, one thing, so east is in the top of these crusade maps always. So this is then um, west. Here we have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre depicted as a circle. Why? Because the defining feature of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is its dome, or it used to be its dome anyway. Um, well, it still is the dome, I would say, yeah. But back then it was even more prominent, a, a more prominent part of, of, of the church. <clears throat> and the Dome of the Rock, here also depicted as a circle. Everything else isn't, but those two are. Why? Because they had big round domes that were defining structures. Um, it's not, of course, not the only one. Here, Holy Sepulchre, here's a circle. Dome of the Rock is depicted as a circle. Why? It's round. Next one, Holy Sepulchre, round. Dome of the Rock, round. Okay, here we have something slightly different. Um, here we have the Holy Sepulchre up here and the Dome of the Rock here. Um, very two-dimensional, difficult to say, but it doesn't look like they tried to depict an, an octagon. 
um, they try to depict it round I would I would think because um, there are no lines coming down there um, Then here's another of these crusader maps. Again, the double door coming here is round. Church Holy, Holy Sepulcher, round. Because of their domes. And these, these are the oldest um, depictions that exist or that survived. And the Church Holy, Holy Sepulcher, round. Oh, here, the Dome of the Rock isn't round. But if you look closely, uh, let's zoom in. Um, yeah, it looks like they tried to make it round here yeah, the 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 dome um at least it's how i interpret it um but yeah no circle um behind it so that's that's different but then here next one again so we saw during the time of the crusades um there was a rock round holy sepulchre round and then we have one more, um, you know the drill, Dome of the Rock, round, Holy Sepulchre, round. And then here we have um, a relief from the uh, um, Sultan Hassan Madrash in Cairo, depicting the Dome of the Rock. And because it's a relief, it has some three-dimensional properties. And you can see how here the drum comes out in a round fashion and goes back. It's clearly round. Uh, that is not. This is not how an octagon would be depicted. Um, and yeah, this is thirteen fifty, by the way. Um, then here, this is from Hugo Cominelli, a um, map of Jerusalem. And here we have the Dome of the Rock, depicted as being round. This is a Francis Franciscan monk, uh, Franciscan friar, um, an eyewitness again, and the drum here looks very round on the Dome of the Rock. Okay, now here this is, to be honest, uh, I would say <laughs> not not real not a real argument. Um, this is for Bayard Breuer in the fifteen hundreds depicting the story of uh, Simpson uh, and in the background we have this building. I only included it because AJ put in these strange Italian uh, paintings with an octagonal drum and thinking that it's some kind of evidence, which it's clearly not. Um, same is true here, but here we can see yeah, this is a Dome of the Rock-like structure with a round drum. Um, so I'll take it for what it's worth. And then lastly, um, this is from 1590, again, a, by a Franciscan, and let, let's zoom in a bit. So he did have some troubles with perspective, but we can clearly see that he tried to do an octagon down here. I mean, he failed, but he tried. With a drum, he didn't try. Um, this is just round. Um, so you have tons of evidence by eyewitnesses depicting a round drum. We have octagonal drums by people who were not eyewitnesses and who derived their work from uh, this book, wherein it kind of looks like an octagon, but it's described as being round and probably only looks like an octagon because of um, the limitations of the materials they were working with. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the evidence in pictures of the shape of the Dome of the Rock. I would say this is a pretty solid case here that the Dome of the Rock has always been round. Um, but actually, we will in the next episode, we will see more uh, of the same um, when we look at the descriptions by the pilgrims. Um, they pretty much all of them describe, describe it as being round. Um, evidence which AJ apparently just likes to ignore. Um, but yeah, with that, we are at the end of part one. Um, yeah, I hope you <laughs> you like uh, what I'm doing here. It was a lot of work. Um, yeah, this was the second take. I've been now busy here for hours just recording, let alone reading all the references and um, the books and looking for pictures and finding connections between like this book and everything else. Um, 
So if you appreciate what I'm doing, then please like uh, the video, comment on it, share it with, with your friends who you think may also like it. And of course, um, you can also directly support me on via Patreon. The links are in the description box if you think um, yeah, my content is worth it. So, uh, now I'm tired <laughs> and I thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode when we look at the textual evidence. Yeah, until then, have a nice day. <laughs>